Richard, thank you so much for coming to our little studio office in JLT. Uh, very this funky is studios, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for being here. Um, we've known each other for, for quite a bit. Uh, our careers have kind of, um, I think, paralleled a little bit. Um, <laughs> and it's been you know a, a lot of fun kind of seeing you progress. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you've done. I think Steve and I have a huge respect for what you do. Um, so for starters, thank you for being here. Um, and um, I think what I would love to start with um, is is kind of getting to know you. Um, I know uh, you on the surface. I know you, I think, professionally. But on a personal level, I've, I've always been quite intrigued in terms of understanding, you know, what brought you to Dubai? What led you on this journey? Where you're from? Why are you in media? Et cetera, et cetera. And I would love for you to tell us a little bit about what brought you here. Yeah. Um, to begin with. Well, thank you. Yeah. And thanks, Christy, for having me on. I, you know, I'm a fan of what you guys do from a duck life, from a branding point of view for clients, but also content creators, because, you know, it's important to have other parts of the media ecosystem, either incumbents or, or new or old. And it's just interesting to see how media evolves. So it's, it's pretty cool what duck it is. Thank so, you. Uh, well done. We're keeping it going. Uh, so, yeah. So, like, basically, uh, I've been in Dubai since uh, the summer of 2012. Uh, I'd moved to London at the end of 2009. I'd been working since I graduated in 2006 in sort of digital advertising and marketing. And that was, you know, it's been social media from day one and since then. Uh, and as a young exec in an agency, loving social media uh, from the start was a great chance because it was also new and when something's new, say like crypto, if you're young and fresh, then you kind of have an advantage yeah. because there's, there's nothing else you've learned. Like if you're sort of 20, 30 years into a career to learn the latest thing, you know, some people are, are grappling with crypto at the Absolutely, moment, yeah, but yeah. like the kids aren't, they get it, you yeah. know, and it's the same with, with social back then. It was just, it, it was I natural. just kind of, yeah, I just jumped straight into it, you know, and, um, I was the champion within uh, the agencies I was in, which led me to, you know, really finding uh, We Are Social in London, which became the kind of leading social media agency around the world. And uh, I joined them as I think they were 20 employee and they grew to 500 or 1000 around the world. Um, but so that was kind of London and I loved it and I was into social and um, I had a blog, a burrito dating blog that got picked up as a viral concept. Um, and uh, I joined MEC, which is part of, which is now Wavemaker, part of Group M, part of WPP. And that was a different, you know, We Are Social was, it was before paid social in a way. So they were the conversation agency and they wanted to be seen as a creative agency. They wanted to be at the top table with Coca-Cola, not the ones yeah. replying to customer service. Yeah. Um, and, but MEC gave me a different angle. It put the power, it put the media money behind your ideas in the same house and same roof so that was great and uh, uh, you know i wanted to really uh to answer your question in a different way like you know i like sort of art and culture and things like that and i like i studied german and economics but i like the term zeitgeist and i like to yeah. find a city that something was happening in like i said i wondered like what was paris like at the turn of the the 20th century with picasso and all this stuff or, or what's the swing 60s in London like or whatever, what's it like um, to live in somewhere that's going to be written about in the future as things were happening then or great minds sort of got together or whatever. And I felt like London wasn't really what I thought it would be. It was an amazing city, very multicultural, way better than Dublin in many ways. You could be who you want, do what you want. But I didn't think uh, it was really happening, except in the year before an event, which is interesting for Expo, the, I was in Germany the year before 2006, the World Cup, and mm -hmm. that was an amazing moment for Germany, the World Cup. It was the first time since the Second World War that uh, they, the people on the street used the German flag, right? It was a kind of a, it was kind of, you know, a generation, a few generations kind of understood their identity a, a again. Or they were, every, yeah, and proud and in a different way. And you know, uh, London had a little bit of a moment during the 2012 Olympics. I don't know what it's like since then. I left on the eve of it. It, it was a peak. Like, it was a peak. Yeah, yeah, that, that period, like 2011, 2012. Yeah. For me, I was the same time in London. For me, that was like, that was like the pinnacle of that time. And it was so hard to like, like follow it through, right? Just everything tailed off. 
Yeah, but, interesting. Uh, yeah, it was super yeah. interesting time. Yeah, it was a fun time. And like, yeah, and I think maybe our age as well, we were having more fun. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Definitely, it was it was definitely a lot of nostalgia. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Like yeah, I, I gotta tell you, my festivals. my 2010 to 2012 was amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was I ten think years ago, guys. Than the... We're not that old, guys. <laughs> no, it was ten years ago. We were like <laughs> mid twenties. As young as you feel. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. That's that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we were having fun. Yeah. Uh, cool, but it's so. interesting that you see Dubai. It's it's interesting that you describe Dubai as potentially a place where. You know, it was a change-making city. It I was, think so. It was, you know, and and it, I never thought about it that way. But from mm. the outside, it's true. Dubai does have all the ingredients to be described as like an agent for change in the world, where where things are going to be innovated, where creators were going to come together, where where having impact and and and, and influence yeah. was going to definitely it, happen. It doesn't. I think zeitgeisty just means to feel alive. It's like media platforms need to feel alive. Like not necessarily the Picasso reference, but like something's happening yeah. and the, the melting pot and things like that. And I love that immediately from the Middle East. My job was to, my role had, the company had other offices. So I was a yeah. lot of the time in Beirut. I was a lot of the time in other places as well. And uh, yeah, so I, like passionate about social media and media and that sort of led, like did that role, a regional social media director role up until 2015. And it was it's very corporate, like it was setting up Facebook pages for clients and things like that. It was that yeah. type of a role. Um, so yeah, but that, that was great. And like originally, you know, uh, wanting to sort of um, like figure out, you know, what's happening next with social media, like everyone tries to kind of figure out what's happening next in trends. Um, but, you know, like often in creative services, people would say, hey, you run, you do a job for 10 years and then you kind of either own the small agency or you do something else. Like it's it's a young person's game sort of Absolutely, thing. Yeah. So that's I kind of had that in my mind as well as I kind of, like I came here at 28 and I'm 38 now. Uh, so like I kind of had that in mind. And, you know, by the time kind of 2015 come around, I was kind of thinking, okay, what what to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, and it's interesting. I mean, when you when you first started, um, you started as Love in Dubai. Yeah. What was kind of in your mind at that time? What was Love in Dubai supposed to be in your mind when you had kind of framed it and you launched and you wanted to build that platform, that brand? What was the, your objective? I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know what it was from a, from an outside in how I would have framed love. I can tell you how I structured it yeah. now and how I position it. But um, you know, I think like Chris, it was it was like I was t saying it was sort of I didn't think of it as I do now as a media company and a publisher. I thought of it more as sort of a business and a branding thing in terms of what's next with social media. And I mentioned We Are Social. Now the creative talents in London aren't with We Are Social, they're with Lad Bible, or they're with, you know, yeah. uh, you know, the Group 9 in the US or, or whatever. Like they're with Vox Media, because the, 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 the media platforms can do the social media piece for the clients and different things have happened. So yeah, I mean, it was, uh, my friend had set up Love in Dublin. I nearly set up an agency with him in 2009 in Ireland during the recession. Um, and he went on to uh, sell that and do really well out of it. Uh, not that I regretted it. I wasn't ready. I was kind of too young. But um, so I messaged him and said, what are you doing with Love in Dublin? And he said they had spoken to an MD, uh, his MD, and they thought, well, let's do a franchise model. So uh, I wrote a 10 year area developer agreement, launched Love in Dubai on the 1st of September in 2015 had a quarter of a million page views in the first month. And at that time, uh, uh, my, like for example, my blog in London had 5,000 page views in a month. And I thought, okay, this is a bigger number, right? <laughs> and I remember working on Dubai Calendar at the time. We had, one of my first, our 2012 was to launch that as a website and they were really happy with 25,000 page views a month. So I knew that this was a big number. And I was working as managing director of a tech bot startup company that, that's no longer around, but, um, I'd, I'd left that Mindshare group, but to do things kind of by the book, I had an NOC, I hired an editor from ITP, from Silas Magazine, I hired a junior salesperson, and that was it. It was two people in an office in Astrolabs, and I got to Christmas time, and I was like, because I'd put in a bit of cash, my brother and two other people, and we, overall, in that sort of eight-month period, 
we put in $160,000. That's it. That's the only outside money that's ever gone into the business. That's amazing. And, but we were out of that money pretty quick, <laughs> right? Like, and it came to, I remember sitting down with uh, the editor. She's amazing. And I said to her, she was like, it was kind of April time and I was joining on the 1st of May. And, and she said, this is 2016. And she said, um, oh, not much happens in Dubai in the summer. I'm going to work from London. Like, and I'm kind of like, stuff happens like you know it's yeah. like it's like someone said to me why would you launch in jordan because nothing happens in jordan I said, there's four million people on twitter like stuff hap- like it's, <laughs> it doesn't the same with saudi it's like why would you launch there you can't it's different but actually it's the internet right you're curating what's happening on the internet so you know so so there was that so she was she wanted to do kind of pt stuff and she was really cool about it and said yeah you do this now so i took over as editor and i can't really spell i'm an editor but I knew how to, and I, like I kind of shoot myself foot, but I knew how to do growth hacking and clickbait. And I knew that, and I was dedicated to it, right? Like I could remember so many stories where like it's that sort of getting out of bed in the morning and before you go to CrossFit or go for a run, you're getting an article up because the plane has gone down or whatever. Or like we didn't miss a photo of the day. Like we just don't miss a post. Like it's, it's 12 hours a day, seven days a week. It's just constant publishing. And... Um, in Astrolabs like that's just all I did I just did that and then by the end of 2016 I, I knew like I thought I with an audience we would get advertising agency money yeah and we didn't and even though I knew everyone in that world and I came from it it was really hard yeah of course part of it part of it we were blocked a bit from Insido and, and OMD sort of stuff uh, but it was just very hard anyway like it's like hard to kind of get started anyway so we we started the kind of a restaurant package model like three articles a month like a pr retainer started getting some page some revenue from that by then 2016 i also had a few social media accounts like infinity middle east nikhil moles and things like that but that wasn't really that i didn't want to become a social you didn't media want that agency to grow. That because was a... it was being commoditized yeah. and you know and then there was the conflict stuff and then seven days shut down and then i spoke to their ceo bought their social profiles and we had, I got, we got the page views. There were still two hundred and fifty thousand by May twenty, when I became editor. Got them up to seven hundred and fifty thousand by December twenty sixteen. With the uh, seven days merger, that pushed us over to a million. And then in June twenty seventeen, on the fifth of June, the Qatar blockade, we wrote twenty three articles that day, and we got two point nine million page views that month. Whoa! So this was into uh, 2017. March 2018, Facebook did a big algorithm change. We had 18 million page views in 2017. We had 12 million page views in 2018. And our revenue went up 70%. Like there was no correlation. So that was an eye opener. And we had a legal issue over something like a defamation case. And these were all things that we're learning. Like, how do you do indemnity? How do you put these things in place? Like, how do you understand media guidelines? What are the guidelines in a country that you know, does have guidelines. Like, it just because it doesn't have the First Amendment doesn't mean it can't have media, right? Like, I think it's really, uh, taking a step back, but I think it's really... Yeah. Anna, you, you've yeah. said so many things that I want to dive into right yeah, now. It's do, crazy. Do that. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. D- don't apologize. I mean... Chris, Chris is like this. <laughs> it goes through. Yeah. Fuck, man. What you just said, there's so much in there. It's super interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. One thing I just want to I, I just want to talk about is... Um, what I find super intriguing in what you said is is the way you built the business or the way it kind of evolved. Because today there's like this huge obsession in like this entrepreneurship startup space that you have to have almost all the answers, right? Before you even start. And that's, I think, because the nature of, of, of kind of the process. So today in this, you know, springtime of entrepreneurship that we're living through right now, you know, tons of cash, tons of VCs, yeah. lots of problems to solve. Everybody has gone through kind of the journey of what is my business plan? What is my business model? What is my forecast? Because everyone's pitching, everyone's raising money. And naturally that has kind of evolved business building towards a very structured approach, which I believe nine times out of 10 is really unnatural, inorganic, and generally will, will make you fail if you don't really need to fail. 
And what I mean by that is when you were describing kind of the journey, you said, you know, we started as this, then we did a bit of that. Then we did a bit of social media just to, you know, pay the bills because that's what we had to do. That's life, you know. And then we got into this and then we got into yeah. that and we, you know, then we did a story about this. Then we bought that, you know, those those handles and, and that helped us. And if, if, if we had asked you before you even launched <laughs> to put a business plan together, none of that would be there. Yeah. Right. And it's like. And I just find that so interesting it because is, yeah. it's it's very similar to us, by the way. Like, like we we didn't raise any money. We didn't like, we don't intend to, you know. And it's like it's just so funny because today there is a, a huge obsession with entrepreneurship that, you know, I need to know exactly how I'm going to do everything. I need to know what the solution to the problems are, and I need to have kind of a very clear view of how I'm going to do those things by raising money, by by doing these partnerships, by whatever, by building this tech, and. And I find that so like I find it a like a breath of fresh air to be honest because it's I find like that's really how great businesses are are yeah. built because they need to be kind of organic they need to kind of like respect the journey rather than forcing something to happen in a specific way. I totally agree. Like so hard to force growth, isn't it? Like yeah. Why would you force growth? Like we're you know to kind of bring step forward and, and being transparent. We're now forty full time employees. We'll do $4 million revenue this year. We have eight people on the ground in Riyadh, nearly all Saudi national media graduates. We have eight people in Cairo. We're building a 12,000 square foot unit in production city for $1.5 million. Here? Yeah, six wow. studios. Just yeah. finished the demolition. Yeah, yeah. well done. <laughs> Spot <laughs> zero on Twitter. But like, yeah, so that type of stuff. So like, but that's all come with a bit of like figuring things out. But also there's two important pieces, which is planned. Like, in, when when we had Augustus as the name, so after Augustus was the license, which licensed Love in Dubai. Yeah. We didn't, like the guy in Malta did Love in Malta as the business. I always eventually had the idea of something under this. And I wrote down the mission is to become the new modern, new media company of choice in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, so that can mean like that we want brands, they won't want consumers to choose our media and our brands. And that modern media piece has sort of played out well in terms of text, audio and video, what, what's happening in the US with BuzzFeed and Vox Media and these type of brands. Like if you launched when TV was big or when, you know, New York Times launched 150 years ago, you, the medium you pick is depending on, and now you kind of have to do text, audio and video as a modern media course, company. Yeah. So, so that's one thing that we stuck with. So we chased that sort of thing of like the region, digital and then the brand IP. So we don't we're not we don't do influencer agency. We don't do talent management. We don't build a platform. We don't do ed tech like say Nasdaq are doing now. We don't yeah. we don't do it. We stay in our box, but our box is complex enough because there's so much digital stuff happening. And the other piece is Joseph our finance director is brilliant at planning and budgeting, right? But we plan and budget for the sake of our balance sheet, not for the sake of valuations. Like we're running it on balance sheet and cash flow. Like that's so so we'll never get a nice valuation because we make money, right? And media is the most unsexy industry right now. Like Absolutely, yeah. I know a guy in Media City who has he does three million dollars in revenue last year and he got a valuation of one of three million dollars, a one to one revenue, right? Like, you know, it's just insane. It's like when music was ten years ago when the buy the guy bought Sony music for nothing and listed it now for loads like so like i think there's that sort of phase in media like even if even if we wanted to get a lot of the the liquidity around at the moment it's still yeah. even hard even Absolutely. if you wanted to sell the dream on media but but not selling the dream uh not promising loads of things works for your culture like mm -hmm. it, it works for this sort of like organic allows things to happen naturally i think you i mean you've probably gone through two periods and you're probably experiencing another period now like you said during the upbringing, 2015, 2016, it was really when, like, especially on social media, a lot of stuff started to change, right? The way that you would go to audiences, the way the algorithm started to like shift. Have you, have you seen like an impact on your business now with some of the more recent changes? Is that starting to filter through with like how your articles are being received or able to like target different people? Are you, are you starting to see another wave of like, because there's a business model, but you're impacted heavily like you're at the mercy almost to an extent with the, the, the guys who distribute, right? When it comes to like Facebook, Twitter, Google, are you starting to feel like another wave of like stickiness when it comes to, yeah, tension almost? 
Yeah, not really. Like, I think, I think kind of moving with the platforms, moving with the, like reaching people in everywhere and allowing your business model to follow that. You know, uh, in, at the end of 2019, 95% of our revenue was from sort of advertising in terms of content that we would still have to uh, create the content and do the reports and uh, do that piece. Um, and then the traditional way of advertising and moving online is display or booking an ad in a magazine. That was never big for us. Like it was always programmatic and it was yeah. always near the open exchange. And at, at that in 2019, it was only 5% of our revenue. Now it's 30%. Why is 30%? Because we call that audience revenue. So it's on owned and operated, but also on um, rev share. So we have a show in Saudi called Meme and Kester Social Media, which is, is the biggest show on Snapchat in Arabic in the world. Like it's the biggest show and it, it delivers a lot of revenue from us, but we don't have to sell it. There's no app, Snap do the selling. So it's like the YouTube revenue. So we, we call that piece for our business, the creator economy in terms of we label our 30 or 40 Instagram accounts as creators, not a media business. Mm. And, we'll, and we'll chase that money because we'll monetize everything. So we monetize Twitter. Like if we do a, a Love in Dubai show in the morning that people might necessarily watch, that's eight two-minute clips for the rest of the day on eight platforms of which you get a penny for each video from a pre-roll and, a, and, and you don't have to sell anything. And then, the, and then the third bucket of revenue that we see is the, you know, direct to consumer but we're really cool and you you guys are like this are calling that the token economy because it's transactional it's yep. that sort of web mm -hmm. three it's that piece of, it's not just subscription it's anything of value that can come from a, a person like the first two doesn't come from a person but to get your business there a you have to create value behind a paywall or not or members or whatever and b you have to uh change the mindset of your organization you now have people who want to be served food at the table right like you now yeah. have customers as opposed to audience audience like is amazing if you get billions of views and you don't reply to any comments you're going to make money because uh youtube and facebook are selling ads for you so the, 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 i i take your point but basically like instagram is obviously doing really well at the moment in terms of a platform that people use as consumers but also monetizing Instagram felt like a natural fit. Like in, in 2018, we would get paid to do Facebook lives for clients because Facebook just accelerated that juice or whatever. Now uh, we get paid to do Instagram takeovers. Uh, we don't really monetize TikTok yet, yet we're publishing a lot on it. But that sort of approach I think works across all three of those financial buckets. Yeah, I think like you say, moving with the platforms and the audiences and just seeing how those trends, like you can, you can monetize in you know many different sure. ways. It makes total sense. I think the token, the token, like the direct to consume stuff, like not now, but certainly further down the line. We won't go into <laughs> detail, <laughs> but you know, further down the line, I really think that's an interesting like development that will like hugely disrupt. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super curious to get your personal opinion on what you think the role of kind of what you do or media in general is on society. And and it might it might be different um, in different societies and cultures, etc. I mean, but but the Gulf in general um, is is going through some sort of a renaissance, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering kind of how you see the impact and your responsibility within that movement, right? I, I feel like yeah, you, you might have something interesting on that. Good question for asking. Yeah. Look. Um, well, first of all, like in the Western world, they often they have the First Amendment and things like that, freedom of speech, and they say. Journalism needs to hold people to account. And I fundamentally disagree with that because that's what lawyers and your systems do. And Judicial systems. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like journalists, like there's a, a founder of the information, which is a, a subscription platform in Silicon Valley. And Jessica Lesson is the founder. And she says that what a journalist does is to shed light on information that doesn't exist. So what you're doing now right? This information mightn't exist publicly. And that's a really good agenda to go into a meeting with. Not like, hey, you want to, you know, you want to take this person down or you want to defame someone. So I actually like the media guidelines in this region. You know, uh, respect elders and respect the leadership, respect Islam and respect someone else's ability to make a living. Don't defame. Don't go in there and say, hey, this restaurant is crap. Right. Like now you could debate that and, and people can. But 
for me, I like simplifying it because it makes my job easier. But, but, but like, it also takes a bigger question. I think what you're asking, and we still need to figure it out, right? Like, Love in Dubai, we've always said we're local news. Like, people say, hey, you're doing more news lately. No, like, we wrote about transgenders who were blocked in the airport four years ago. Like, like, you know, like we always did local news. We hired someone from Seven Days. We hired an editor who used to be with The Sun. Like, Love in Dublin was always local news. It's like, people say it's not a newsroom. Well, it, what's a modern newsroom? Like, how, how do you do these things? So, but then there's, like, the vision for Love in. We want to be in every city in the region. But, but local news and lifestyle are local news and entertainment. And where do you step back? And where do you say you're an entertainment company or a hard-hitting journalist company? And with Smashy, the thesis behind Smashy is, like, loving... We say we have mindset brands under Augustus. We don't yeah. say, like, say ITP or traditionally you might have uh, an automotive, uh, a food or whatever. We yeah. say we, we have mindset brands. That can be passion brands. But it's helped us decide, okay, loving is love in your life. And Smashy is driven dreamers doers. Smashy might be like Cheddar and OTT in the US, um, but it might be like Bloomberg. But we say driven dreamers doers on the thesis that there's a cohort of young people in the region who want economic prosperity. Because um, that's what, you know, we've seen. It's different to what the Western world thinks. So Smashy's trying to tell those stories. Now, we did verticals with Smashy, Smashy Crypto, Smashy Green, Smashy Gaming. Pan-Arab media is hard. Huffington Post, Arab found it difficult. Even Step Group, Pan-Arab is different, difficult. Yeah. I think if you do Pan-Arab, we're doing it as verticals. Um, and Lovin, we're doing it as horizontals. So we're not diluting the Lovin brand. It's always the city. It's always a place name. Otherwise, you have to do Mina, Arabia, or language. Like, how do you... If you do an English platform in the Middle East about dogs, you're going to get huge traffic in the US. So how do you make it? Because... You know, because the, the dogs is the horizontal um, across all the breeds. But so, uh, you know, Dubai is the horizontal and that's the, that's one approach. But then, you know, I've always asked these questions in terms of like, at what point was New York Times outside of the state national? And I don't believe it's international. They think it is. But, you know, so what would love in Dubai be versus can we realistically in this region, can you know, with with all the continued sort of change that's happening, can we realistically have something vocal like Love in Dubai in every city uh, within the Gulf, within you know, the wider region, um, irrespective of economics? Can, is that something we can do? Um, so yeah, like, I, I, I'm you know, as optimistic about you know, global globe market, emerging market about this region as anyone. Maybe I doubly convinced myself, but I, I, I study economics, I, you know, I, I see GDP stuff, right? And when Buffett used to say bet on America, like if you look at, if, if you go back on, on Google and you put in, if you pick four or five countries and you put in GDP 40 years ago, if you look at the UAE compared with the UK, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. The US is obviously growing fast, but we used to be taught, thought of the BRIC nations as emerging economies. But there's something really interesting happening, obviously in the UAE, but how can that spill over to the region? And I, you know, the uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed here tries to do things that inspires the youth, which you know the uh, Emirates Mission to Mars and things like that. Mohammed Salah, in the same respect, is inspiring the people on the street uh, in Egypt. Right, there are people kicking a football who are now have hope. Right, and that's that's something like Chris off air. You mentioned about brands in the region and looking. Like having reference points in this region Internally, is important. Within us, yeah. With startups, how, the companies that you know that you guys that you work for in terms of exits and things like that, and even yeah. Noon, Hamid Al Abar says, you know, almost confrontationally that you know, um, if Jeff Bezos came to his house, he'd poison the food. Like, what? Why would? <laughs> why, why would Amazon take uh, this region? I think that'll be our clickbait title <laughs> for, the, for the for the podcast. But, 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 I'm but, just gonna cut that I, piece out. I love that that new news there. But, but you know, we spoke about the other day. We literally mentioned. Yeah, this. absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, I, I think I take your point. I think it, it's really interesting the way you framed it. Like like media is not a judge or a juror. Media is kind of a, 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 a kind of spreader of information. It should be a reflection, right? And, and well, uh, 
an yeah. unbiased reflection too, right? Like oh, it's true. Uh, that's a very important word. And yeah. I think, and, 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 and I think, like, and I think it's very hard yeah. to do that, right? I, it's I don't think there's any way to guarantee that. Like it's uh, human nature will always persist. But I think fundamentally, I think what you're trying to say is we're not here to judge. We're not here to like distribute an opinion. We're not here to to kind of be the jurors of what's right and wrong. But in in the best way possible, what you're trying to do is make sure that you give the information irrespective of a side if there is a side but at least have a very balanced view of how much information you're putting out there irrespective of the topic right and i think i get that and i think a parallel that you drew as well is and i don't know if you if if that's what you meant but i'm just trying to make sure if we look at the region we look at our youth we look at the information that they have we look at their ambitions we look at the aspirations uh, the role of media if i were to kind of understand what you're saying is if we don't give them this information if we don't distribute this information if we don't make it accessible, if we don't share these stories, um, if we don't share this knowledge, then then our output, our productivity, our ambition, our aspirations are harder to kind of you know target, are harder to develop, are harder to kind of run after. So it kind of sounds like what you're saying is media actually has a whole, a, a full responsibility in kind of accelerating whatever the movement of that of, of that place is. The maturity of media has a huge impact on, on, on a region or an audience capability to move with the times. I think yeah. that's a great parallel, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, I think, yeah, literally what you're saying, the media is amazing for like, like portraying a vision, right? It's like leadership, it's alignment. With media today, right, everyone, the access that people have to information and like, whether it's across different social platforms, what people are sharing, I mean, there's just tons of noise out there. So I guess you can just go in, you can respond with Chris, but like secondary, like how do you distill? Like how do you start to distill kind of what to share? Because there's so much stuff out there, particularly with like the loving brand. But it, and sorry, I'm not gonna answer for you, but it sounds like he's saying I shouldn't distill. Yeah. yeah, well, I think like it's a really interesting conversation mm. and maybe journalists would debate it at a different level. But like, I think um, what is Disney a media company and the, does it, and they were an entertainment company. Are they local news? And are we talking about journalism here? Are we talking about information and media as a business? Like, I think taking an, another step back in terms of, I think the leadership in this region have chosen media and the internet. Uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Empire, the Ottoman Empire, for 300 years banned the printing press. So, if they were around now and to degree or whatever, then there would be no internet. So <laughs> people who say that, you know, there's freedom of speech or whatever, well, there's internet. Like, and I think, you know, I'm not, uh, like there's internet that suits the culture and the constitution. And what I love, you know, geopolitically is that the region has almost been, if they see, seize the opportunity now, they've, it's an opportunity to kind of be your own culture, be that sort of, Arabian hospitality and do like that's that's what I love about Saudi Arabia because and you know it better than me Chris but like it, it's a domestic story like yeah. it's, it's 25 million people who've never been to Alola like it's a, it's a domestic story as much as it is a foreign tourism story and it's just so interesting the opening up at that level and what we want to do on Lovin is document that not not almost take a side but that's just Lovin but like Another thing that we define, okay, we do digital media, but we also try to say we're non-scripted. So we try and say in our box, A, because scripted costs sort of 10 times more than non-scripted. Sure. But also when our journalists, and they're all journalists, like even the commercial content is written by people who study journalism. And we keep it that way. Like even the social media is journalists because going back to the shed light and information, if you studied engineering, if you studied economics, you actually think a certain way, like as much course, as you, you know, and if you study journalism, you kind of fact check. And I get, I, I would prefer that they were marketers and growth hackers and other levels, but they, they do check stuff. Yeah. And they, and they, they're not concerned about whether the Coca-Cola company has a hyphen in it. They're more concerned of, you know, what's the substance of the article. And so we, so when they come into the office in the morning and they're doing the show and they're writing or they're deciding, uh, you know, Steve, your point, the, the, how we distill, they're deciding what goes up. Um, they're, they're really figuring out what were people, particularly in Love in Dubai, what were people WhatsApping each other last night about? And they look around the office and they look around the ex-nationalities 
and ethnic groups and whatever demographics and they kind of go okay right and that's that's how you remain culturally relevant like if we miss something that's amongst because people say oh, well who reads it it's obviously expat or whatever i don't even go i don't even like that term like i think i'm an immigrant i never identify with, with expat i don't like it at all it's right very true. and you, you know and like yeah because you know there was there weren't um expats in america there was just business people and immigrants or whatever right and but like th that allows for diversity in the office it allows for diversity of choice it doesn't prioritize you know there are some vocal people in the office who get excited about a news piece and I'm kind of like, yeah, okay, there are 250,000 people from 10 million of your nationality here, right? Not that relevant. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so yeah. like that, that's the kind of, that helps deciding things. There are 600,000 people from Egypt here. So we'll write about Mohammed Salah. His agent might want us to take down the posts because he's in Jones, a grocery store in COVID and Liverpool fans won't be happy, but like that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? that, that, that sounds uh, like a real story. One, I guess one follow up to that, which would be interested to get, get your take. So I don't know if you kind of experience it here or kind of just what your like perspective is on it kind of globally, but the, ma the amount of misinformation that there is kind of out in the world today, like we talk about fact checking, you know, fake news, false news, whatever it is, like how, how, how does your team kind of deal or like, you know, check stuff like that and kind of what's your perspective on the way that kind of media has changed so much and the volume and the need to kind of be first and quick, you know, at the expense of quality and like truth? Good question. Like, I think, um, first of all, like there is no deadline anymore. Like there's no, like the print runs at the weekend or whatever. So if the deadline is now, that means your whole organization needs to be uh, real time. That means your access. So we have WhatsApp groups with government entities. We have, you know, we've designed, we purposely chase this communication level to enable uh, speed, right? And some, and everything's geared around that. Everything's geared around speed. But, well, first you put in journalists who have a sense to check and who aren't, and you don't incentivize. Like, you know, Gawker, who got done on the Hulk Hogan thing, like, or whatever, they, and other organizations, they incentivize page views. So it, 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 it what's incentive alignment within a news organization, right? No one gets public, punished for making a mistake. Right. Yes, speed is important to be relevant, but you're not we're not saying, hey, get this growth. We don't we don't want the growth like we want credibility, but we also don't want to be slow because that's not a case of sacrificing quality. It's a case of media should be as if it as as fast as platforms. Well, why not? It's digital. Yeah. I mean, where does news break the fastest or where do you go for the fastest breaking news is Twitter. Yeah, Twitter. Right? Yeah. yeah. Immediately. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's about designing the organization to be going back to sticking in non-scripted. If we've, we've that show in Saudi now that they want, so we're making more shows and scenes and like, you know, do we end up going down this route? Um, I invested in plant-based news in the UK recently and on their deck, they said they wanted to make a Netflix show. And I'm kind of like, that's interesting. Like, you know, Vox Media have explained on Netflix, but they're not, hiring script writers and production and you know they're not doing that type of piece and i think like i think what we need to do is continue to excel at at news publishing you know and the interns and the organizations that we work with here the institutions and the media forums are to bring in young arab talent who are journalists like we want to bring in media personalities and we want to kind of do it in that way but like Sorry, just jumping on another point related to sort of that, like Smashy, we, we thought, let's A, make a brand, B, uh, I keep saying A and B today, I know it's wrong with me, but um, <laughs> <laughs> how I'm thinking, but uh, yeah, anyway, um, so. I'm waiting to see what C is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm right. going to ask her and I don't, C. Uh, you probably yeah. noticed, I like, catch myself on it, but like, so Smashy, we thought, hey, streaming's going to get big, so let's do streaming. And that was a mistake. Like the medium, media and medium. And I think we kind of touched on this before yeah. about like news and entertainment. What is, uh, what is media, right? Media is a cohort. Like why don't Lovin have 
a platform for females empowerment why don't we why don't we have a gender based platform why don't we have an ethnic based platform why don't we have a a sport like a cricket platform or whatever right mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's interesting, like when you start deciding on what's your lens, what's your media lens, and then you decide what's your medium, right? And, you know, why has Morning Brew, a newsletter that curates, that doesn't create original writing, curates links, why has it got 4 million subscribers in America? The reason it's got 4 million subscribers is because there's around 30 million day traders on Robinhood. So there's a behavior that has a cohort that needs media. And if you, if you understand media in that sense, then you can understand it with populist, with serious, with sport, with niche, with mainstream, with gender, with, you know, so, so that's kind of, uh, you know, we probably would have had more success early on with Smashy if we just launched a podcast or if we just launched a newsletter. Um, I personally uh, believe, and luckily we've had the, runway to reinvest and to build the tech ourselves but so we we're doing all the transcoding we've just finally procured a piece of software that does the play out we've built the apps we have our own developers finally and everything like that right but what excites me is that uh there are eight million subscribers of uh svod platforms in the region in a region that give or take 17 22 arab league countries whatever 350 400 million people whatever um, 90 million people used to watch Pan-Arab TV at its yeah. height during Ramadan or whatever, right? So 8 versus 90 million. Okay, media won't be as monopolistic as it was before, but there's, there's an interesting thing happening in TV around the world, right? In the US, in, by 2025, 100% of households will have a smart TV. In this region, by 2025, only 20% of households will have a smart TV. 10% really? do now. Wow. So only... So app flicking, channel flicking. So how do you get market share? What's too early? What's too late? I think streaming, I, I know you worked with OSN as well, but, yeah. but like the, the opportunity for growth is 2025 to 2030. So, you know, it aligns with vision in, in Saudi and things like that. But for me, I'm building Smashy for then. I'm building, Smashy will have, you know, Doge or BAT or Coil then. It'll have that or whatever the token is of that day for subscription it'll have it then, but we will organically indigenously figure it out slowly. And, you know, I struggle with this a lot because there are investors who are in touch. There's different things and things like that. But, and they're, they're all always their sell to you is let's accelerate growth three to five years. I'm kind of like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. And I, th I think that's a really interesting point because if we're, if you want to look and understand kind of the way that media or the, like the way that people are going to consume things by come 2030, kind of we've already touched on it when we talk about tokenization, but when it comes to the role of media going into kind of that next decade, and we're starting to see it, we had um, uh, Sarag on the show, right? And yeah. we spoke about um, kind of Egypt and like this boom and growth in terms of this young audience coming through. I think you're right. If you're building today within that kind of media space, and you're thinking kind of like, okay, forget all the people who want that instant like dopamine growth. You think, okay, 2025 onwards, that wave, if you set yourself right in you know, the ability to own your own audience and make sure that you've kind of got that infrastructure in tech and the understanding within kind of like your employees as well around what their interests are, what they're kind of consuming. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a hockey stick wave in the future it's just not there quite yet. And it sounds a bit like what that's kind of the way that you're trying to structure yourself with Smash is, you know, you're looking at the kind of those learnings of the past when it came to loving. And then, okay, like for now, we know that we're in this trans, you know, transition phase. Like, what does that look like in the future? And it is a bit second guessy, but it's almost, you can almost see kind of where you're like leading it to. And I guess you're probably already starting, you're, you're probably, your, your inspiration of that, looking at some of those Western places, you know, Western brands that are starting to like take that movement. You're starting to kind of see that, which is not here just yet, because you're, we're kind of just, we're behind, but not, we're, we're catching up, but we're still, we're, we're, we're still, still just, at the forefront. still not at the forefront, but the, the gap is getting shorter here or smaller here. Yeah. I, um, I would like to ask you like um, a, a more organizational question um, in terms of how you run your company. I think, um, one thing I keep kind of realizing about your business is that you've basically built adaptability in your organization, right? It seems to be like part of your culture because 
from love in dubai to 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 operating in this in in this country in saudi with with which is also a very different country to smashy changing mediums to to journalism versus you know content and information etc cetera, etc cetera. it just sounds like you have an extremely adaptable culture mm. <laughs> as an organization and i wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit more about how you did that and in terms of how you do that as you scale out your teams because being able to adapt and change is inherently extremely difficult for organizations yeah. um, and and it just seems that that's that's the kind of success story behind what you're doing is your ability to just fit that culture fit that market fit that kind of medium fit that that evolution in social media whether it's changes by facebook or apple or private, everything sounds like what your success to me if i were to dilute it in one word is adaptability mm. and i think that's that's super super interesting and i wanted to see like Yeah. How do you do that culturally within an organization and how do you do it successfully? Yeah. I was going to say, because I, I don't think you have a choice in media. If I think back of working in media back in the, you know, I was in London as well in a media comm. So kind of understanding the, the speed of change, right? Even the speed of change then, it was it was a yearly thing. Like now with tech and, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you're, thing, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, and it's critical to the success of business yeah. in media today. Like you have to be able to like move with trends and those trends move at different paces across different markets. I'm so curious to see like, how do you do it institutionally? How have you been able to kind of... Well, I don't know if this is related, but our values are velocity, tenacity and ingenuity. And coming working from agencies in digital, I felt that those types of things, and they've got seven or eight behavior types under them. Of course, That yeah. those type of things uh, can help service clients they can help get things out fast they can help empower that left brain linear thinking sort of la yeah. lateral thinking sort of like empower ideas so you know when journalists or interns or junior people come in they're encouraged to use their brain like the, the, the brain is the most important asset like that's why we're paying them like there's they're encouraged to go and do stuff and it might be frustrating but there's definitely no rigid boxes so that's one sort of culture of that sort of make decisions but then there's also a, a structural process i'm listening to good to great uh jim collins book at the moment and he talks about disciplined people disciplined thinking and disciplined action and that's so important as well um and i i've been able to you know i really kind of happy with my role as an employee in this company in the last sort of five years because my life just revolves around this augustus business which is which means i'm i'm quite disciplined around it and you know that that sort of approach goes through as well um so that type of thing i think ingenuity part is really important like ingenuity by default meant diversity yeah like i remember being in a company and the founder didn't like the name of the receptionist so changed it to something cooler also let that receptionist watch youtube all day because they didn't have work to do because he didn't believe in that person's brain right like in terms of so what, what i love about building a meaningful business over a long time hopefully inshallah that we will that people can grow like people can grow in in the business and you know i used to want to be a football coach and things like that so that's one of my personal rewards it's not profit at all costs it's kind of like is this an environment that uh people in this profession can grow and that's really what what you know is rewarding and it really is like you know we're very disciplined in terms of uh, we have an employee manual we have a uh, annual reviews we've you know they all know when they can ask for a pay rise it's quite like yeah. they, you know it's it's flat but there's definitely still a, a, a structure because you know you know the good to great book also talks about level five leadership It talks so much about level five leadership kind of forgets the kind of level one of being good at your job level two of being able to work with people level three about being able to manage people level four about being strategic Right. And then level five is about humility, leadership or whatever. So it's just interesting in that level. And I think what happen, happens in this region is people skip some of those steps, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. and then um, and organizations don't just automatically promote people, even if they're not great at working with people or they're not great at managing people yeah. or conflict resolution and things like that. So definitely like there's uh, and it's why I kind of fought back a lot on this sort of work remotely and work from home thing. I get it that it can work for some people, but yeah. from from my point of view, it's like it's like if I'm a footballer and I sign for a club and I in my contract I say that I'm not going to train with these guys 
because my pitch at home is better, you know? Yeah. How do you gel? Like, yeah. how do you, like, and yes, like the metaverse, I knew we get it in there somewhere. But <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm tired of talking about the metaverse. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm done with it. Man. Anyways, but but absolutely, I, I agree with you. And, and, and we've had that reflection too as a company, you know, creatively. Yeah. How do you work creatively with people if, if, if you can only do it through a screen and, and through Zoom and through structured conversations? Yeah. Like creativity can't always be structured. Yeah. And and what True. what digital conversations have brought is structure in conversations. Yeah. Which breaks down a lot of the creative processes, right? True. Um, yeah, because the creative processes is that you you're in a room, you're talking over each other, you're feeding off different energies. When you're on a Zoom call, you're it's like you wait to be spoken to. Yeah, you have to be attuned to your colleagues yeah. to be able to work and exactly. gel together. Yeah. Which yeah. is very difficult to do. And may, a, maybe it might, maybe our avatars will be able to, you know, gel together yeah. one day in the by the metaverse. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Sony rejects the metaverse because he isn't fully like embraced or understood it fully yet is how it's going to be constructed. You can, and I've said this before, I'll go on camera and say, you can allow Zuckerberg to construct it or you can participate. If it's what Zuckerberg described, I'm not signing up. Yeah, of course. But, uh, <laughs> that's my point. That's my point. No, you no, allow no. Zuckerberg to construct this. Yeah. Like, and his vision is rolled out. Of course, your Ditopian like view of the world and you're going to go be a lumberjack in the like Absolutely. hills of that's Canada. Makes I'm gonna, sense. I'm gonna unplug. Exactly. <laughs> One day when I'm done, I'm just gonna unplug. You won't be able to. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be plugged in. You should be working on your social credit system right now. I'm, quite, right. I'm working. Yeah, on this will be digital. digital. No, and he's already marked. This yeah. will be my legacy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Richard, we, um, we debate this a lot. <laughs> like, a lot. Um, um, I just want to end by saying thank you so much. We really, really, really appreciate the conversation. Your thank transparency, you your insights, your learnings. I think it's been an amazing conversation. Thank you so, so much. Um, and I can't wait to see where you guys are going to be 10 years from now. Cool. Um, thank you, guys. Definitely, definitely still plugged in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, It'll be more plugged in. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I appreciate the time and, 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 and congrats again for, for everything yeah. you've done. Thanks, Thanks guys. for being on the show. Thank you.